All right. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Eric Davies, and I'm here to talk about return type annotations. Who here knows what those are? That's pretty good. I'm going to tell you what they are anyway. Um, everyone's probably seen a type assertion before. Uh, this situation, this is saying this value must be an int or throw an error. Um, many of you will have seen this sort of type annotation on a variable, which indicates to the compiler that this variable has to contain an int. Um, if you try to put something else in it, throw an error. And then this is a return type annotation. Uh, in this situation, the type annotation is saying this method has to return an int, um, convert it, make sure it's an int, or throw an error. And return type annotations can depend on types in the method signature. So you see the complex T uh, return type there is the same T that was matched uh, in dispatch. Um, return type annotations can be expressions which call functions on those types. So here we have uh, another example from base where it's promoting bool with whatever type T matches. And they can depend on functions of arguments so here, we're not depending on the type of uh, iter. We're depending on a function of iter, uh, in this case, L-type. And they reply to every possible return path. So even though this could return multiple different, uh, from multiple different places in the iterator, it's still going to apply the same conversion. So I think it's important to know how these tools work that you're using. So I'll explain how this works under the hood. Uh, it's magic. Yay. Um, which means lowering. Uh, Jameson talked about it a bit earlier. It's the compilation phase that translates the Julia code you write into simpler, compiler-friendly Julia code. Um, here we can actually see, using Julia's wonderful code introspection tools, how lowering has transformed a function with a return type annotation. You can see it uh, calls convert, then has a type assert that ensures that the, it converted to that type. Uh, so these two function definitions are equivalent. Um, they generate the exact same lowered code. So we can talk about why you might want to use these. Um, they're used in a few places right now in base and in a few packages. Um, probably not as much as they could be, though. Uh, one reason is compiler hints. It's probably the most suitable use for this sort of thing. Uh, you can compensate for interface, uh, quote unquote, failures by adding annotations, like this example from jump. Uh, the comment talks about how it wasn't inferring the right type. They added a type annotation on the function and suddenly knows it's an int returned now. You can also simplify output conversions when you have lots of return paths or you have a complex return type that you don't want to clutter your code with. Um, here's one example from base and hashing um, where there's looks like four different return statements, which each return a different combination of types, um, but they're all, in the end, converted to that tuple type up there. There's also um, this one, which I sort of made for this slide. It's a, a I guess, a sort of a lifted version of addition, which promotes the inner type on a nullable. This is not necessarily what happens with nullables. I didn't double check. But this is one way to use uh, return types without cluttering up your code. It's clear in the code that you're doing get x plus get y or returning a null. Um, 
and it's clear from the function definition what type is returned. Another reason it's just nice for documentation, uh, return type annotations make it clear and enforce what the uh, type of the return value is from a function. Uh, maybe this could be integrated with documentation or documenter in the future and we can generate sort of function signatures that show return types when they're there. Um, this is just an example from some code that we have where it doesn't really matter um, because that filter function is always returning a bool anyway, but we've marked it there so that you can understand by looking at the code what's gonna happen. So what's some interesting things we can do with these? Well, as mentioned before, return type annotations just are converted into type assertion. Now if we could trick the compiler into creating a type which matches an existing type but has a special convert method, we can do some fun stuff. Here's a squared type which is equivalent to number but we're converting to it squares a number. So add of two plus two and two is 16, which is two plus two squared. Don't do that. <laughs> Never do that. But um, that was a little fun thing uh, if you feel like messing with Julia. Um, what are some maybe reasonable, non-trivial things we can do with return type annotations? Well, I did one uh, last year. I sort of was really excited to get return type annotations in, and I wanted to demonstrate that they could be cool and do something interesting. Um, so result types.jl uh, is a package that does something interesting and not terrible. And I wrote it during last year's JuliaCon, and it's about 64 lines, so not actually that large. It contains one type, which is result, and that contain either some value of type T or some error of type E. It's a value or error type, if you've heard of those. Um, you could use it instead of a try catch control flow to get some big performance gains. And in, with return type annotations, it ends up looking pretty nice. So here's an example. Suppose we want a function that performs integer division, but returns zero when the divisor is zero instead of throwing an error. Well, we could just use a try catch like this, or we could use result types. So here's a method that performs integer division, but returns a result. Um, I've aliased div result here to, it's either an int or a divide error. So it gives you the same information that div gives you, but without throwing an error. And then we have uh, a corresponding method that works the same as the first func one. Now we have func two. They do the same thing, but this one uses result types and instead of exceptions. So what does this get us? Well, exception handling is expensive. When you hit an error condition, it performs stack unwinding, which is sort of an expensive operation. You can't really compile that out um, to like some instruction. So it ends up being a bit more than what we would like. But result types, very fast, much faster. Uh, it ends up being 0.02% of the time uh, with only 32 bytes allocated, um, as opposed to zero bytes, I think that it's totally worth it. <laughs> Probably, depending on your use case. Maybe you don't want to allocate any memory, that's reasonable. Um, the big caveat when using result types is we gain speed by avoiding tracebacks, so you don't get tracebacks with the errors that are contained in result types. That can sometimes be okay, maybe you don't want that. So takeaways from this, uh, return type annotations, good for compiler hints, simpling output, simplifying output conversions, especially with multiple return statements, and good for documentation, documenting your code. And maybe use it 
result types if you think it might be good for you. And in conclusion, that's me. That's my company. We're, we are a sponsor of JulieCon and we're hiring. Thank you. <laughs>